God with you this morning. I'm going to show you two um, photos of the, the areas that you will see in our message this morning. The, uh, the mountain range you see there to the left is Mount Yoboa. You see that mentioned in our passages in Samuel. That is actually the place where King Saul and Jonathan will eventually lose their lives in the battle with the, uh, the Philistines. If you've ever looked at a, a map of Israel, up on, right by the Mediterranean Sea where the Philistines had their primary land of occupation, the land is flat. And as you move toward the east, you have a lot of hills. Then you have flat land again where the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, all are the valley. And then again, as you move towards the east, you have a huge ranges of mountainous areas. And so sometimes the geography makes a huge difference in how battles were taking place. It helps you understand why every army wanted to control the Jordan Valley area, because if you were coming through Israel, going to Africa, or heading up east towards Europe, you didn't want to necessarily go through mountains if you could control the valleys. And so a lot of battles are fought strategically. You'll see people running to the hills, hiding. Um, so just knowing what the land looks like makes a huge difference in setting the scene for some of these battles. On the next slide, uh, you'll see a city called uh, Michmash, which will be instrumental in our passage uh, this morning where Jonathan is going to literally climb on hand, and knee, and foot, ascending some mountains to attack the Philistine strongholds. It looks like a suicide mission, uh, that you'd literally be climbing up while the enemy is watching. Uh, but God is going to give him the victory. Amen? All right, let's uh, prepare our hearts to receive Word of God from 1 Samuel chapter 14 and 15 and the message we've entitled Foolish Vows and Rebellious Pride are a Toxic Combination. Foolish Vows and Rebellious Pride are a Toxic Combination. We just talked about vows that are supposed to be made as Monte and Shante made marriage vows before the Lord. The Bible tells us to not make vows haphazardly, thoughtlessly. God says it's better that you not make a vow than to make it and to keep it. So the question is, what kind of vows have I made in my life? Vows are words of commitment that should never be said without thoughtful consideration and resolute determination to honor the spoken words. There's a danger in making vows that don't honor the Lord. We must be humble enough to swallow our pride and renounce every self-defeating vow we have uttered. If we do so, we can become spiritually and emotionally healthy and able to serve the Lord rather than our own agendas. I'm intrigued by studying the life of Saul, and, and not for just learning biblical information. But one thing about studying someone like Saul, you see that it is entirely possible to be given everything you need to succeed and still fail. And largely because of something we, we like to call the sinkhole syndrome. Have you noticed on the news a lot of sinkholes have been <coughs> exposed where there were houses and cars that looked like they were on solid ground? And all of a sudden, the, the water underneath is gone, and suddenly there's holes and caverns, and everything collapses instantly. We saw the collapse instantly, but what was going on underneath didn't happen instantly. So the danger is that we're not guarding our own sinkholes. There's things in our own lives that have been eroding and decaying, and we've done a great job of hiding it from everyone else. And all of a sudden, the collapse. And God is saying, you should have been addressing that weakness by the power of the Holy Spirit all the time. And the other side of that sinkhole is, sometimes the enemy doesn't bother us in our areas of weakness because we're already weak. It's our strengths. 
where we're strong in an area and we make the mistake of saying, oh, I don't really need to pray and consult God. I can get up and talk without prayer. I can communicate. I have skills. I have charisma. I can, I've got gifts. I've got talents. I can get by in my areas of strength without being dependent on the Lord. That's another sinkhole. That's an accident waiting to happen. Saul had been given everything he needed to succeed, and he's going to fail, and he's going to fail miserably because he stopped trusting the Lord and trusted in his own kingdom agenda, his own gifts, his own talents, his own resources. And he made foolish vows. And he was a prideful, arrogant man. He didn't start off that way, at least it didn't look that way. But God will put you in situations where you get to see what he always knew. What's going on on the inside. If we would ever work as hard on being for real on the inside as we do trying to fool people on the outside, we could really become strong in Christ. Okay. So we're going to walk through 1 Samuel 14 and 15. I'm just going to hit some, some highlights and my talking points. Trust that you guys will read along. With me as we come to chapter 14, and again, this ongoing battle with the Philistines is, I mean, it happens over just decades and decades of, of time. When you get to chapter 14, Saul is kind of sitting around trying to figure out what he's going to do, how he's going to attack, if he should attack. We saw last week where he didn't wait on Samuel and his army was disappearing. He felt he had to do something and he sinned by what he did. Well, he had a son by the name of Jonathan who was actually a very good leader who trusted the Lord and he wasn't worried about the size of the enemy's army because he knew his God was able to give victory. In chapter 14, the word of God says in verse 1, It happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that's on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Midron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. My first point this morning is that the Lord is never hindered by the amount of available people because he can accomplish miraculous things through any person. Didn't you read about Gideon's army where God thinned out the crowd so they wouldn't think that they won because of how many soldiers they had? Didn't he use one man, Samson, when he got his act together to destroy a whole lot of Philistines? God is saying, I, I don't need a multitude. I just need one person who will surrender and let me do miraculous things through him. So Jonathan is saying, let's go get him. Now, you, you saw the lay of the land. He is ready to just climb up and fight. We saw last week that they had very few weapons because the Philistines had basically taken them. But Jonathan is saying, everybody else is just standing around. Let's, let's go do this. Notice he didn't tell his father. Uh, look at letter A. In order to accomplish God's will, there will be times we have to respectfully work around poor leaders like Saul. Now, I know you guys can't relate in this church context. <laughs> Let's talk about your job or, your, or some other environment where the leadership is not on point. And you know something has to get done. You want to be respectful. You want to be biblically submissive. But you know that we really got to work around this man or this woman or what God wants to get done won't happen. So Jonathan does not tell his father. He tells his armor bearer, let's go do this. Okay? And so they start to climb up the mountains. It's a small, narrow place. And in verse 4, you see two strange names, Bozed, Bozes, and Sene. And that means shining and pointed. It's just describing the craggy rock area that they had to climb up. Okay? Sean, if you would read, please, from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14, starting at verse 6. 
Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you, according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. Go all the way to verse 14. Please. Okay. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hid. Verse 15. Okay. So both of them. Uh, So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. That first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. Okay. The Philistines see these guys climbing up and say, these Hebrews are giving up. They've been hiding in the rocks and the holes. They're just, just crawling up to surrender. The next thing you know, they've climbed right into their camp. And two men, grossly outmatched, take down 20 soldiers. God can do miraculous things when we trust him. Now look at letter B there. Those who trust in the power of the Lord have learned that the size of the army doesn't matter to God. He supplies the power and He gives the victory. We never limit God to what we think He might do in a given situation. Let Him surprise you with how He works things out. But the next thing you know, there, there's chaos in the Philistines' camp. They're, they're hearing rumors that we've been invaded. There's a fight going on and they start attacking each other. God sends earthquake and some of the Hebrews who had sold out before, now they join in the battle. And the next thing you know, there's this huge victory. Because two men had the courage to say, God doesn't need a lot of us. He just needs us to trust him. He's already told us he'll give us the victory over our enemies if we trust him and obey him. So they had to work around poor leadership. Saul gets with the program after he sees what's going on. So you've been in a situation where you, know, you come up with a great idea and then your boss wants to take credit for it. Oh, yeah. So they fight and they win and, and Saul first called for the priest to get some help and he, after a while he said never mind we're, we're just going to go ahead and, and move. And so the battle rages and in verse 23 of chapter 14 says so the Lord saved Israel that day. The battle shifted to Beth -Ay. Wouldn't have happened had not Jonathan taken the lead, had not Jonathan taken the initiative. So if you find yourself in that difficult situation, say, Lord, I want to respect the leader, but something has to be done, and he or she is not being sensitive to what you want accomplished, I guarantee you God will show you how to, how to get it done. Okay? Now, we're in verse 24, chapter 14. Saul says, 
The Bible says, verse 24, the men of Israel were distressed that day because Saul had placed the people under oath saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. I said a little earlier about the danger of making rash, unbiblical vows. Saul said, okay, nobody eats until we win this battle. I, I put a curse on anybody who eats until we win this battle. Some of you are looking at me and saying, we know that will never happen. I want to thank all of you that participated in the Feed the Pastor program on the 4th. Uh, it went well. We're still accepting uh, entries. The Saul did exactly the opposite. He said, nobody eats until we win this battle. He's weakening his own soldiers who desperately needed the sustenance of the food. There's no logical, biblical reason for him to make such a statement. It was a foolish vow. And as you read the rest of the story, at one point his men are going to become so hungry that they violate all the kosher commands of God in handling the blood properly because you know, God said the life of all flesh is in its blood and so he demanded that blood always be treated respectfully because it signifies life. So the men got so hungry later that they just violated the vows and just started eating basically raw meat. They were that hungry. They were that famished. They were that weak. Meanwhile, Jonathan hadn't heard any of this. So he'd eaten some honey and gotten refreshed and gotten strengthened and gotten revived. But Saul's going to find out about it. And his pride and his arrogance are going to move him to the point where he's ready to kill whoever violated his command not to eat. Follow me letter D in section 1. Why don't you see this? Foolish vows need to be renounced. They're self-serving, they're destructive, and they will jeopardize every relationship. Your behavior today might be affected by an inner vow that you made that needs to be repented of and renounced. Saul is going to go through the, the process of trying to find out who violated my command. And when you read in chapter 14, starting at verse 37, the Bible says, Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? God didn't answer him that day. So I said, come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see what this sin was today. For as the Lord lives who saves Israel, Lord be Jonathan my son, he'll surely die. Not a man among all the people answered him. Then he said to all Israel, you be on one side, my son Jonathan, and I will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, do what seems good to you. Therefore Saul said to the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. So Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. Saul said, cast lots between my son Jonathan and me. And Jonathan was taken. Uh, in case you're not familiar with this, uh, there's a proverb that says the, the, the lot is cast but the determination of the lot is in the hand of the Lord. I'm paraphrasing. Basically what they were saying is, it's like, I hate to use this terminology, but like a roll of the dice where God would use what came up to show who was guilty or innocent. Or on the priest's garment, he'd have certain lights light up to show his will. And so what Saul was saying is, Lord, show me who it is that's violated my command. I don't care if it's my own son. Whoever did it is going to die. Well, Jonathan is exposed as the one who would eat. Look at verse 43. And Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you've done. Jonathan told him and said, I only taste a little honey with the end of my rod that was in my hand, and now I must die? Saul answered, God, do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. Now, wait a minute. Isn't this your own son? 
Isn't this the one who helped you get victory over your enemies? Saul says, yeah, you're going to die because I said nobody eats. Verse 45, the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan die who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan. So he did not die. Foolish vows, pride, arrogance. I said nobody is going to do this until I say so. I used to look at Saul and say, how foolish. Why would you say something like that? But see, a lot of us have made similar vows. Some verbally, some in our spirit. They're hindering us in all of our relationships to this day. Some of you have said, I will never let another woman tell me what to do. I will never let a man tell me anything. I will never submit. I will never, I'll never marry anybody who looks like this, or talks like that, or works at, Did God tell you something? All right, now. <laughs> what was that song title we shared last week? It's sad to belong to someone else when the right one comes along. Remember that song? You better stop telling God what you're going to do and not do and making your own choices about who you're going to be with and who you're not going to be with. Those were not biblical vows. Those were your own way out of whatever situation you thought you were in. And God is trying to send people to you to help you. But because you made this promise 20 years ago, I will never do this and I will never do that and I will never let any... Really? Don't be like Saul. You're killing yourself. You're killing relationships. You're not doing it for the glory of God. You're not doing it for His kingdom. It's for your kingdom. Some of you saw some horrible modeling in your home. And you said, I will never put myself in a situation. I will never trust anybody to take care of me. I will. Did God tell you to make that vow? See, at the end of the day, you need to trust God and trust God with the people in your life. Trust God to heal your hurts and stop being so toxic in your relationships. Because if you're not careful, you'll do like Saul. You will destroy people who God sent to help. Jonathan was there to help his dad. He's ready to kill him. As we move on, you're going to see David was doing everything he possibly could to help Saul. What does Saul want to do to David? Kill him. Why? Jealous. Jealous of people that are helping you. We're jealous of people who are more gifted than we are. You know what one of my former pastors said? He said, that person has been gifted to help me and glorify God. Why should I be jealous? They're helping me. I'm supposed to be helping them. God decides who gets the gifts for his kingdom, for his glory, and for your good. So why are we jealous that somebody can do something better than we can? Learn from them. They're helping you grow. Jonathan, I'm going to kill you because you violated my command about Eve. And at that point, his own army said, you know what, enough is enough. And Saul backed down. Sometimes you have to call the, cop, the, the bully's bluff, don't you? All right, let's, let's move on. The, the wars continue in, in chapter 14. I'm, I'm jumping over to chapter 15 now. Partial obedience is still classified as disobedience. It's better to do what the Lord demands rather than what makes you 
Luke. Samuel also said to Saul, chapter 15, verse 1, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I'll punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack, Am go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and not spare them and kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now that looks harsh, so let me take a moment to qualify. On your handout, you see, uh, let me read this for you. Saul's going to spare the king of Amalek because he wanted to show off his conquest and humiliate him. God had given orders for his execution. Specific orders from the Lord must always be obeyed or we suffer consequences. Okay? We just read the specific order, right? There's no confusion about what God wanted. He said destroy them all. Why did he say destroy the Amalekites? They'd always been antagonists of Israel. God had given them more than enough time to repent. This had been hundreds of years. When the Israelites were coming out of Egypt, on their way to Canaan, as they went through the land of the Amalekites, the Amalekites attacked them from the rear. They attacked the women, they attacked the children, they attacked the weak, they attacked the infirm. It was brutal, it was heartless, it was cruel. And God said, okay, it's on. He gave them time to respond. This went on for centuries. That attitude never changed. They kept attacking and fighting God's people, God's agenda. So now God says, okay, time is up. And some of you say, okay, I can see that with the adults, why the, why the kids? Well, as cruel as it sounds, God was actually rescuing them from allowing them to grow up, to become like their parents, to get on his wrong side and be lost forever. And we never think about it. He actually delivered them from being raised up to become like their parents, to become God-haters. So he took them before they got to that age. He said, destroy them all. We have no such command as Christians today. We are never commanded to physically destroy our enemies. We pray for them. We love them. We try to win them to Christ. We are never commanded to have this kind of physical holy war like the Jews were. That they had to learn this lesson graphically. We've learned that we don't have to go. So you have no biblical justification to go out and try to physically destroy the people you don't like. I just want to clear that up. Okay? Take that off your to-do list. All right, let's move on. First, chapter, first Samuel chapter 15, verse 4. Saul gathered the people together, numbered them in Tilium, 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah. That sounds a lot better than the 600 he had in the previous chapter, doesn't it? Saul came to the city of Amalek. He lay in wait in the valley, and he said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Did you catch that? Before the order of execution, he told the Kenites, you know what, you guys need to get out of here and we don't want to destroy you with them because you have treated us fairly. See, all the Amalekites had to do was the same thing, repent and do what God wanted them to do. They too could have, would have been spared. See, when, when God brings a hammer down, He's already given people time to repent. We, we see the end result. You don't know how many times God said, okay, you need to stop. You may say it for weeks, days, years. And then the God of patience says, okay, that's about enough. Time out, game over. And we say, oh, how could God have done such a thing? you shown grace and mercy. I mean, the fact that we're sitting here proves 
that he shows grace and mercy to sinners. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 7. Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. Everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Didn't God say, don't leave anything? Saul says, I'm going to spare the king, and we're going to keep some of these animals. We'll keep the good ones. Uh, we'll get rid of the, the weak and the lame. Okay. Problem is, that's not what God said. Look at letter B. Disobedience grieves the heart of the Lord and the hearts of those who care about God's will being done. Are you a heartbreaker? You put a smile on God's face with your obedience. Or did you get one of those looks? Really? Didn't I just tell you not to do that? In verse 10. 1 Samuel 15, verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me. He's not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel knew this was coming, but it still hurt. Yeah. Haven't you done that? You see somebody get in position, and yeah. you just know that their heart isn't quite right, and you keep praying. You just hope it doesn't happen, but then it does. It hurts Samuel. And notice God said, it, it breaks my heart to see Saul doing what he's doing. Not that he didn't know it was coming, but God has feelings just like we do. He experienced love and joy, and he experiences heartbreak when we don't do what we're supposed to do. And you know why? Because he loves us so much that he doesn't like to see us hurting ourselves. And every time we sin, every time we think we know more than he does, we're not just breaking his heart, we're hurting our own selves. Verse 12. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul who was told Samuel saying Saul went to Carmel and indeed notice this he set up a monument for himself and he has gone on around passed by and gone down to Gilgal now in verse 13 we're going to see Samuel getting to Saul but what I notice on the map if I'm not mistaken is that okay, Samuel is supposed to go meet Saul It looks like this is 35, 37 miles from where he was. Now, I have a car, and if I drive to Akron to meet you and get there and find out you are now in East Cleveland, I'm going to be a little salty, but at least I am in a car. We have no record of Samuel's transportation, so I'm led to believe this was a foot journey. So he gets there only to find out Saul has disobeyed, erected a monument to himself, and now he's about 25 miles over this way. Really? So there goes Samuel again to meet Saul. Samuel's a godly man because I would really have an attitude about him. <laughs> Verse 13, Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the sound of the oxen that I hear? See, this is the second time that Saul sees Samuel coming and he grows up to greet him, all happy and smiley face. Hey, 
Samuel, good to see you. I did exactly what God wanted me to do. Aren't you proud of me? And Samuel says, if you did what God told you to do, I wouldn't be hearing these animals. But he said, Phew. Verse 15. Saul said, and here's, here's pitiful leadership right here. They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we utterly destroyed. We have this phrase called throwing somebody under the bus. <laughs> Did you see what Saul just did? Saul had been given the command, wipe out everything. Who's in charge? Saul. Samuel, we did it. If you'd done it, I wouldn't hear these animals. Well, the people, you know, they wanted to keep some of them. We killed the rest. Verse 16. Samuel said to Saul, now my translation says, be quiet with an exclamation point. Shut up. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what the Lord said to me last night. He said to him, speak on. Don't miss it. Look, look at verse 17. This, this is one of those highlight verses. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, fight against them until they're consumed. Why didn't you obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul, so, Back when you weren't all that, didn't God give you glory and honor and opportunity? When you were little in your own eyes, look what God did. Now you think it's all about you and your kingdom. And you decide whether or not you're going to do what God wants you to do. It's fun to talk about Saul, isn't it? Go home and look in the mirror and think back when you didn't have all that and God set you up. And think of the diligence when you first got saved on fire for the Lord and doing this and obeying and committed and now you got what you want. And now you pick and choose how you're going to obey God. Get out of your driveway. Get back this <laughs> Look at verse 20. Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek, Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Verse 21. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Again, he says, but I did what God wanted me to do. It was them. Whose decision was it to bring back the king of Amalek? Saul. Who had the authority to make the soldiers destroy everything like God said? Saul. Why is he blaming the people? Look at letter C. Poor leaders like Saul shift the blame to others instead of taking responsibility for their own sinful choices. Amen. How we view ourselves will affect our view of God. Humble yourself. Exalt him. You know, at, at some point, we need to stop blaming everybody else for what we do. People pressure us, they influence us, they intimidate us, they sweet talk us, they pay us, whatever. But at the end of the day, God holds you accountable for what you do or don't do. 
So you just have to stand in front of the mirror and say, you know what? At some point, I exercised my will to disobey. And now I'm responsible. Doesn't matter who didn't love you, who didn't support you, who didn't encourage you. At some point, you decided to do whatever you did. And God said, that's on you. Jesus never let people talk him into doing anything out of God's will. And he demonstrated that through his yielded humanity, through the power of the Holy Spirit. That means we can do the same thing. It's uncomfortable. You may lose some friends. You might lose a job. But you don't have to sin against God. If you do, it's on you. It's on me. We brought them back, Samuel, to sacrifice to the Lord. Well, that may sound impressive to you, Saul, but God said, I don't want those sacrifices. Have you noticed we're pretty good at giving God stuff he doesn't want? You ever notice what some people donate to church and charity? Well, this isn't good enough for my house, so I'll give it to church. Here, God. This is my $20 purchase, and where's my $220 write-off? If it's not good enough for your house, why should it be good enough for God's house? I'm just asking a question. God gets the old car, you get the new car. Samuel says in verse 22, As the Lord is great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. Don't miss this. He also has rejected you from being the king. Never minimize the sins of rebellion and stubbornness. Those actions expose a heart that's rejecting Christ, and the outcome will be tragic if repentance does not occur. Saul, what you did is the same as witchcraft. He partially obeyed. And God says, you know, that's that's idolatry, that's demonic, that's self-serving, self-serving. Don't laugh off your stubbornness. Don't laugh off your rebellion. Don't laugh off your partial obedience. See what God thinks about it? God says it's ugly. Who are you to decide how much of my commandments you should obey? We all do it. I don't want to give. I don't want to serve. I don't want to be faithful. I don't want to be committed. I don't want to be all in. Aren't you satisfied with a little bit, God? I'm doing more than my neighbor. I'm doing more than I used to do. Is that what he asked for? When he was on the cross, how much of himself did he give for you? On your handout, you see Matthew 9, 10 to 13, and Matthew 12, 7 to 8. Jesus strategically picked up on a piece of this story about sacrifice. And he, he told the Pharisees, he said, go and learn what this means. I'd rather have mercy than sacrifice. We instinctively give up stuff that we can do without anyway. That, that's why we don't, you know, you go to some churches and it says sacrificial offering on the envelope. There's a reason we didn't put that on here. We put tithes and offering. We didn't put sacrificial offering. Because in most cases, what we're giving is not really sacrificial. It's tip of the iceberg. It's what I know I can do without. I can give this to the Lord and still buy all my electronic toys and all my clothes and who I want it. So it's not a sacrificial gift at all. It's an ease my conscience donation. It's a look at me, put something in the plate 
when it goes by. God is saying, was that a sacrifice? Some of us tip better at the restaurant than we do at the church. Wow. <coughs> wow. 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 I need to take a sabbatical after today. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. Verse 24. Now, now there's a little bit of conviction, but watch how he tries to get out of this. Okay, this, this, this is another one of those stand in the mirror moments. We're almost done. Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned. Took you long enough. I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. See, he still can't quite man up. Now watch this. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. Samuel said, I will not return with you. You've rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Verse 27, as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today. And has given it to a neighbor of yours who's better than you. The strength of Israel, that's another name for the Lord, will not lie nor relent. He's not a man that he should relent. Saul says in verse 30, I've sinned. Yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel. Return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Mm. This sounds a little suspect. Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. And that chapter ends where King Agag comes out and he thinks it's all good now, right? Samuel? Samuel executes him. Let me make this last point. Pride causes us to want to look good in the eyes of man rather than please the heart of God. If you reject the Lord, you're going to experience rejection by the Lord. I don't know if you caught it, but what what's Saul is concerned about is that Samuel go out with him in front of the people and go through this act of worship so it still looks like all is well. He didn't want to confess his sin. He didn't want to own up. He didn't want to be disgraced in front of the people. But he's begging Saul, please come out here with me and make me look kingly and royal and make it look like all is well. But Samuel's already told him, God has torn the kingdom from you. Just like you tore my robe. God has torn the kingdom from you. You're rejected. It's interesting as, as we pick this up later. The next chapter, David's going to be anointed as king. Saul's going to sit on the throne for at least 13, 14 more years if my chronology is correct. But God has already said, I'm through with you. He's really just keeping the chair warm until David grows up. He has the title, but God says it's over. You, you're just marking time till I get my young man ready to take over. See, there's a lot of people in leadership positions who really aren't in leadership positions because God has already said, I'm through with you because you don't want to let me work for you. So, I mean, you can keep your paycheck, but nothing's happening. I'm through with you. That has to be a horrible thought, to just be what we call a placeholder. And you could be the man of God or the woman of God because you obey him. And God is okay, you have turned your back on me more than enough. I'm, I'm through with you. Oh, you're still alive. Your heart's still beating. You still look good. There's just nothing going on in your life. And then you become like Saul. You get jealous of everybody else's serve God. You can serve Him. Saul cares about looking good on the outside. God says, I kind of care more about what goes on in your heart. Where my kingdom reigns than on the outside. We break God's heart when we care more about our own kingdom than the kingdom of God. You've been given every opportunity to succeed. You're going to obey. 
But this isn't a shouting sermon today. <coughs> it's tough for me to study King Saul and, and realize that at any point, any one of us, myself included, could make that one choice because I don't want to do what God says and suddenly wasted opportunities. You've been given everything you need to succeed. If you're a child of God, do you realize you have the same Holy Spirit living in you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead? How much more do you need to do God's will? Nothing? All you need to do is get self out of the way. Surrender to His will. Get off your own throne. God, I didn't say what almost popped in my mind. <laughs> Let God have his will. Let his kingdom come. Let his will be done. Father, we bow before you this morning, so very aware, Lord, of our own sinkholes and areas of weakness and areas of temptation and areas of vulnerability, Lord. And we just pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you would help us to keep our eyes on you we would surrender ourselves afresh to you, Lord, that we would learn to obey you wholeheartedly, that we would learn to wholly surrender to you, that we would indeed be concerned, Lord, about your kingdom coming and your will being done. Father, I pray for those under the sound of my voice who are in spiritual prison because they, they made vows that they just can't seem to renounce and, and repent of. Lord, they're being hindered and living the fullness of the joy in Christ because of unhealthy, unholy vows that they made to themselves, either out loud, Lord, in their mind and spirit. I just pray that you would bring uh, to our own remembrance that if we've made a promise that was out of your will that needs to be broken. Lord, I pray that we would learn to honor the vows that we make to you and to one another so that your will might be done in us and through us. For our good and your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just a moment. We're going